question to Matt Norman. We have a Q&A channel on the Discord where I think Matt will be hanging out uh, answering questions. How does that look? Looks great. OK. Um, my name is Lisa Dussault. Um, I'm the co-founder and CTO of Compass. And we do um, a lot of Python for calculating a lot of numbers, a lot of currencies and uh, bonus percentages and raise amounts and um, salary bands and cool stuff like that. So uh, I'm a happy returning Python user. Um, this talk actually doesn't have a lot to do with Python, but um, I, I, this, is, this is a rant that's near to, and dear to my heart because I've used so many APIs in my career and I've done API design well and badly and I've done internet protocol design. So I've seen, uh, I, I've seen principles that apply across, um, across the realms of doing communication design between computers that apply to HTTP APIs but rarely get talked about. Um, so what makes a good API? If you ask engineers, you'll very quickly get a list of things that are, uh, you know, associated with good APIs like REST and GraphQL and OpenAPI and hate, hate -O -E -O -S and, um, and getting your APIs automatically fully documented. And you'll get all these answers before anybody asks the question, well, who is the API for? So uh, anybody who's written software that your users don't end up using, like I have in a couple of <laughs> startups, you know that it's not good software until it's good for the person who's going to use it. And that's true for APIs because APIs are for people too. Um, it's weird talking to the void. I uh, usually make strange jokes and then I rely on the audience reaction to tell me if I'm funny or I've completely missed the mark, but I'm just gonna plow onward and <laughs> y'all you can tell me later where I missed the mark. So here's how it often goes. Um, leadership, product people, sometimes a business development guy will come and uh, say like, oh, we got a partner who wants to use um, our data. Do we have an API? Can we build them an API? And engineers say, yeah, technically we can do that. As, as my um, uh, friend and engineer is, is fond of saying, technically anything is possible. Um, then the leadership says, great. Go build one. And often the engineers are um, happy enough because they get to say to themselves, oh yeah, I'm gonna use Flask or I'm gonna use REST or I'm gonna use OpenAPI or you know, whatever thing they've heard about at a Python talk and they think it's gonna be really fun to use. And a lot of these things are fun to use and that is great, but that has nothing to do yet with, the, with why somebody wants an API and what it will be used for. So, Tech-centered design has the incredible merit that you can do it without caring anything about the problem domain. You can list your DB objects that you're going to expose in your API. You can decide what URLs to use. You can say like, oh yeah, cool URLs don't change. Yeah, I'm going to totally follow that principle. And you can expose your queries. You can do, you know, there's so much advice for doing API design that is good advice, but it's all tech-centered. It's all about how you solve the tactical problems. But what about the strategic problems? To answer the strategic problems, you need to do user-centered design. And again, we're, we're probably most of us used to doing this, even if we're back-end engineers, somebody has said, ah, oh, well, the user needs this information and this information, so you're just gonna have to figure out how to get it all from the database, because that's what they need together in one page. That's what the user needs. So let's figure out technically how to do it. What does the user need when you're building an API? You need, a use case, a story. So the example um, from when I worked at a company that had a database of concert and sports event tickets was that the business development folks said, oh, we have partners who um, represent music artists, their record labels or their um, agents or their promoters um, and or their venue um, runners. And they want to be able to link to our site to get last minute tickets. Um, and make it interesting, have information, you know, to, to present along with the links, not just a link to go, go over to this other site, buy, buy tickets. They, they want to show what seats are available, what, um, how much they might cost. Maybe it's not as expensive as people think. Um, maybe they're not free to this Saturday, but maybe they're free next Saturday. So that's the kind of information that these partners allegedly wanted to present. And 
armed with that information, you can build two API endpoints and solve their problems. The first one um, for the labels use case is to query your database by events by artist. And then like, you know, concerts by Lizzo, sort them by date and return them. And then when somebody picks an event from that list of events, return a list of seats and prices and links to go buy those tickets. That's it. I mean, and this is public information as far as this site is concerned. So I'll get to why that's super keen in the next slide. So what if we did the tech centered design, we'd say, oh, we have these database models, we have the event model, we have the venue model, the ticket model, the category model, the performer model, and we're just going to expose all these models because they're all super important because we built them all and we built them into the database and we built the tables and we built the, 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 the Django models. So they're all super important. We're going to allow you to query them. We're going to allow you to get them. We're going to allow you to post to them. Oh, we're going to need permissions because we've allowed posts and then we're going to need API keys and we're going to need throttles and all of that stuff. Whereas with the user-centered design that is fulfilling one use case, you have two endpoints, it's all public information, it's highly cacheable, you don't need to write post, you don't need an API key, you're done. And it, it's very likely to follow the 80-20 rule of uh, carefully picking the effort so that 20% uh, of what you could have built solves 80% of the use cases. It is so tempting to start with something that exposes your data models on an API magically, uh, that, that, that writes all that documentation and builds all those get and post stuff and like builds all those, those view files uh, templated and fills them all in and oh my God, it feels so productive. Why would you spend weeks talking to design and product management people first before even getting started on that? I, having been in, um, involved in many APIs that never saw use, that just you know sat on the shelf basically, still needing maintenance and needing people to update them, needing people to issue API keys only to have the API keys go unused, I would rather spend the upfront time. Um, and I'm hoping to convince other people of that too. And as a user of APIs, I would like APIs that have that upfront lead time that's gone into thinking what would make them useful. What's wrong with learning the hard way? Um, have you noticed how hard it is to get your company to agree to delete something like this? It's really hard for leadership to understand if they spent some time six months ago building an API, why they need to throw that away and make the two people who are using it sad. They already built it. You already built an API. Did you expose all, our our, all of our database models? and it's working, okay, it's great. What do we need to do? It's really hard to, to roll that back once it's released. Uh, somebody has to maintain it. If not the developer who wrote it, then you're lucky. Everybody should have to maintain the code they wrote at some time in their life. <laughs> um, and then of course the user cost. If you don't design for the user, the user pays most of the prices. Um, some engineers are gonna be made to figure out that awful API anyways, and if you put your name on it, they will curse your name. So how do you do this when you're not building an API for your own front end team? Because to be clear, I'm not talking about building the API that your front end team uses. They can come over and yell at you if you build an API that's really hard for them to use. They can read the code. What do you do when it's outside users? And what do you do when you're a company that's building up use cases and connections and users and scenarios and you're not ready to go. Like when Facebook built out GraphQL, they had hundreds of use cases live, thousands of people already using their APIs. So they could build something very general and uh, semantically powerful, like structurally and architecturally powerful and abstract. And that is great for Facebook. But most of us aren't Facebook yet. <laughs> we all can hope to be some days in some ways. So first of all, insist that product and design folks get involved. They may be intimidated at the idea of doing this. So be nice, be like super nice, be like Canadian like I am. <laughs> they may not understand why they need to get involved. So you'll have to like talk them through it. You'll have to talk them through um, why you don't want to expose the whole database. They might've thought that they can skip through their own hard thinking. 
Um, yeah, you have to like really coax sometimes people to um, step outside their normal domain of whether it be drawing buttons or doing information architecture. Tell them it's information architecture, but for programmers. Um, I know I know at least a couple of product people who would uh, who would find that to be an irresistible hook. So um, yeah, be be patient and and coax them into this because they will be of huge help in coming up with these user stories. Define the user, figure out who you believe is going to use their API. If you can, ask them. Oh my God, asking people who are engineers what they want you to build, you will get so many specifics. Engineers are the easiest customers to build for when you need them to actually ask for what they want because they will tell you. I, as an engineer, will tell you if you ask me I will tell you so much about what I'd like your API to do and not do. You will have so much information. It will be great. Just ask me. Um, and I'm going to jump to another example domain because it's the example domain I'm working in right now, which is as Compass, I'm pulling data about companies' salaries and management hierarchy and departments and job titles from HRISs. And HRIS is a human resource information system. Um, and their APIs um, are in progress, I would say, all of them. That's kind of true for all companies. Um, they are not very familiar with developers as a user type. Um, they're much more focused on HR as the user type. And so I think, you know, after HR and then employees, third party developers comes way down on their list of priorities. I mean, some of them do a good job and I'm grateful, but, um, I found some good examples to rant about in the HR space. So HR benefits information provides a fantastic example of when your internal data models don't make sense to the outside developer. Like your database might have tables for employee health plan select event for that you know, time in October when you have to select a health plan and, and they record your choices. And commuter choices and health plan settings and pre-tax options. You don't have to make all those tables be endpoints. Let's not. It's, it's not the most useful thing for me as a selfish user. I don't want all that. I want um, a list of benefits that an employee has. So maybe we take the employee directory and we join in some of this information from other tables about the employee. We join in when they last selected a health plan, what they selected and what their commuter choice was. and. Um, that's all I need. I don't need another endpoint for that information. Or take on other use cases like say, what if we had a chat bot that helped employees pick their benefits and understand what was available to them and make the most of their um, benefits? What API information would that chat bot need? It's okay to sometimes imagine a use case if you really can't get a customer, but like, Imagine small, don't imagine big, don't imagine something artificial that needs every table in your database. <laughs> imagine small. This is just a chat bot that just needs benefit information. That will help you narrow down and solve at least one thing. It's actually a pretty good tip that if you solve small things, you can build to solve large things, but too abstract and you end up solving nobody's case easily. Um, I appear to still have some time, so I'm going to talk about some of the technical details and skip over some. There are some technical choices that are win-win both for the people implementing the API and, and writing that Python code and for the people using them. And a lot of them have to do with efficiently organizing information. Um, I talked about not exposing every single database table as a URL, but also or, or every single database table as an endpoint. Also, you don't need to expose your database models as individual URLs. Um, most likely how you think about the world is not how outside people think about the world. A tiny example of this is category IDs. This is um, back to the event example where category 32. What is category 32? It's soccer. Okay. But is it soccer today? Will it be soccer tomorrow? Can I just cache the information that category 32 is soccer? Do I have to fetch it every time? Um, can it, it's, it's just a tiny little example of 
whoever's receiving this list of tickets and this event ID in the category 32 is not well served by that placement. I have to go get another request. Probably most developers who don't care about your server performance are just going to ask for category 32 every time. Oh, it's soccer? Okay, well, next time I need a listing of events. Oh, it's still soccer? Okay, well, I didn't care about asking again, but you know, your ops team may care. Cases where you can combine information into one result with, with efficient joins are a win for everybody. The example of benefits information, when you can join an employee's benefits information into an employee directory API endpoint, or an even better one is when you can join in category codes, like instead of codes one through eight, you have full-time and contractor and terminated strings. We're kind of taught to prefer variables and constants and IDs over strings, but um, over a text API, strings are pretty user-friendly and not requiring another request to look those up ends up being more efficient than, oh, well, if I put the integer one in there, that's um, nine characters shorter than putting the word contractor. That is a very local and premature optimization, although I've heard it many times to my great sadness, especially when I was doing IETF protocols. Um, the last trap that the auto-generated API stuff gets you into is horrid, horrid auto-generated auto auto documentation. And the focus on auto-generated documentation is what is available to the tool doing that generation. Well, the tool knows what the format is, and the tool knows what the data type is, and it rarely covers what something means and almost never covers what you can do. Um, and so here's an example, jumping back to the HR do domain. Can you even tell that this is in the HR domain? This is the API documentation for a group in an HRIS. What does it do? What does it mean? I still don't know. <laughs> I've been working with this API for two years. <laughs> I still don't know what a group does or what I can do with it. Actually, I don't think the HR people inside the company do either, so it's probably bad all around. But like that kind of documentation, even when it's something for more obvious than group, I mean, it's just not enough. What does it mean? What can I do with it? It, it doesn't connect the dots. It's just a whole bunch of dots and no, no, no numbers on them even so that I can connect them and draw the picture myself. Um, here's another example from a different HRIS of um, failing to explain what something means. I have a payroll job ID and it tells me it's a string, which I could see as soon as I got a, 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 an API response, I can see it's a string. That is the least useful information to me. Can I set that string? Where can I go get it? Can I get more information about it? Will it ever change? You know, all, all that kind of information. Or, or here's one that actually tripped us up with real code. What if you get somebody's hire date? Okay, it's a date, thank you. It's a date in ISO format, more useful. Um, it's a date, um, and it, even though it doesn't say it's in GMT, it's in GMT, actually pretty useful. But did you know that in most of these systems, the hire date might be the original hire date, but is more likely to be the rehire date. So if somebody originally started uh, at a company seven years ago, they left four years ago, they returned three years ago, higher date could mean, it could be three years ago or it could be seven, uh, depending on your HRIS. And guess what? The API documentation doesn't tell you that. So we had um, some errors in calculating that kind of stuff. We had events that made us blow up because the events appeared to occur for the employee before their higher date. Kind of told us what it means. And another thing that I want to that I um, see people get caught up around um, with REST is that yes, get is good for reading and post is good for writing, but you can design those and implement them and express them independently. So rather than have the payroll ID when in the response of in, when you get information about employee and you get a payroll job ID, should you be sending that back to the server in a post? Make a separate example about how to update information like this and show exactly which information can be updated 
It's okay for it to be a different body than the get would be. In fact, it's much easier for the user and it's still called rest. It's fine. Um, one of my last and favorite rants is about API versioning, but I'm not going to get into that one due to time. So if you want me to talk about API versioning and why you almost, almost never, never need to do API versioning, you'll have to have me back. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing if I can figure out where and hang out in the discord and see if I can say hi to people and answer questions. So thank you very much.